Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture four of Introductory Linear Algebra. Today we're going to introduce something called the dot product of two vectors. And what this is, is it's an operation that roughly describes how much overlap there is between those two vectors. Okay, so if, if you have two vectors that are very close to parallel, we're going to see that the dot product is going to be large. Whereas if we have two vectors that are close to perpendicular, the dot product is going to be small. So it sort of captures, roughly speaking, the angle between those two different vectors. Okay, so what we're going to do in today's class is we're just going to introduce this operation and look over some of its very basic mathematical properties. Properties. And then later on in this week, for the next three lectures after this one, we're going to look at all of the neat things that we can do with the dot product, like measure lengths of vectors and measure angles between vectors and stuff like that. Okay, so let's start off with today's lecture. Let's just introduce the thing. So what is the dot product? Well, it's an operation that takes in two vectors, v and w, okay? And we've just given names to the entries of those vectors. And then the dot product, we denote it by v dot w, and what it is, is it's this quantity that you get if you multiply together those two vectors entry-wise, and then add up all of those products. So you multiply together the first entries, v1 times w1, and then you multiply together the second entries, v2 times w2, and you multiply together the last entries, vn times wn, and then you add up together all of those individual products. That gives you a number, and that number is called the dot product. Okay, so starting from this point in the course, we have to be really careful that at every point in any calculation we do, we know what type of object we're actually working with. Okay, because operations like this one, like the dot product, they change the type of object that we're working with, right? Two vectors go into this operation, right? The input to the dot product is two vectors, but the output is a number, it's a scalar, okay? So it's not a vector anymore. So you have to be really careful with this because it's really, really easy to get mixed up and to write down things that don't even make sense in the first place, to write down notation that doesn't make sense in the first place. Okay, so for example, if I write down something like the vector v divided by the dot product of w with x, that makes sense. That's an okay thing to write down because what that means is v divided by this number, right? w dotted with x is a scalar, it's a number, so we can divide by it. That's just scalar multiplication. But if I did something silly like write down v dot w divided by x, all of a sudden that doesn't make sense, right? This is a number divided by a vector and that's not a thing, okay? So be careful here. Make sure that the types of things that you write down actually make sense. An even more subtle one is something like this. If I write down v dot w dot x, does that make sense? And if it does make sense, what does it mean? Okay, so it's really tempting to think, oh, yeah, that's a thing. All it means is we do v dotted with w and then dot that with x. But remember, dot product, it takes in two vectors. It doesn't take in a scalar. And after we do v dot w, well, now that's a scalar. So then this would be a scalar dotted with x. And that's not a thing, okay? We don't do the dot product between scalar and a vector. We can do, you know, the standard scalar multiplication that we learned about last week. But even if you interpret this notation to mean that, there's still something wrong with it because you're gonna get a different answer depending on which dot product you do first. If I do v dot w, and then scale or multiply that with x, in general, you're gonna get something very different than if you group parentheses around the w and the x. Like if you do w dot x and take that scalar and multiply it by v, you're gonna get something different, okay? So even if you interpret that notation very generously, it's still not clear what it actually means. So just don't write it. Don't ever write anything like this down, okay? Dot product, it only takes in two vectors, okay? Let's do a couple quick examples of its computation though, just to make sure that we actually understand how to compute it. All right, so let's start off. Suppose that we've got this vector one, two, okay? So just gonna do a two dimensional example to start. And here I'm gonna draw what I'm doing here as well so that you can hopefully start picking up some of the geometric intuition of the dot product, okay? So there's the vector one, two, uh, pointing one unit over to the right and two units up, okay? And now what if we take its dot product with this vector, 3, 2, okay? So I'm gonna draw that vector, and it's just over here, you know, three units over and then two units up. And if I take their dot product, well, let's just go through the formula, right? You multiply the first entries, I'm gonna get three. Multiply the second entries, I'm gonna get four. And you add those up all together, you get seven as your dot product. So the dot product between these two vectors is seven. Okay, and now I claim that the geometric intuition for the dot product is that, well, if vectors are, are close to each other, if they're pointing in a similar direction, the dot product's gonna be bigger, 
Whereas if they're pointing sort of very far away from each other, the dot product is going to be smaller. So what I'm going to do to try to illustrate that for you now is I'm going to take that vector w1 and I'm just going to rotate it so that's a little bit closer to v here. I'm going to see that the dot product, it does increase. Okay, so in particular, I'm going to construct the vector w2 now. And all w2 is, is, well, it's just this vector, except instead of having entries 3, 2, now it has entries 2, 3. So it's a little bit closer to v now, you can see. And this vector w2 is closer to v than w1 was. And now if I compute the dot product, well, let's see, it's going to be 1 times 2 is 2. And then plus 2 times 3 is 6. So it's going to be 2 plus 6, which is 8. Okay, so the dot product of these two vectors, v and w2, is 8. Okay, and I also claim, well, if I rotate w1 away from v, the dot product is going to get smaller. So now I'm going to try again. I'm going to use the vector 3 minus 2 now and compute another dot product. 3 minus 2, now it's pointing down here. So it's sort of pointing very far away from v. Okay, and this time if I compute the dot product, what's going to happen is, well, v dotted with w3, I get 3 times 1 is 3. And then minus 2 times 2 is minus 4. I add those up, all together I get minus one is my dot product here, okay? So, so dot products can be negative, that's okay. Okay, later on in this week, we're gonna introduce something called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality that sort of tells us how much the dot product can vary, how positive and how negative can it be. But for now, just notice that, yeah, I mean, if I take this vector and rotate it this way, it seems to get more positive. If I rotate it this way, eventually it seems to get negative, okay? So the dot product is decreasing away. All right. You can do this in higher dimensions as well, okay? You can compute the dot product in whatever dimension you like. The algebraic formula works no matter what the dimension is. So for example, if we want to compute the dot product of three, two, one with four minus three, five, well, the picture would be harder to draw, but algebraically, we just do the exact same thing. Multiply them together entry-wise, three times four is 12, two times minus three is minus six, and one times five is five, okay? And then you just add those up, 12 minus six plus five is 11. Okay, and we don't even need to restrict ourselves to three dimensions like we did. Okay, we can do this in even higher dimensions, even in dimensions that we can't visualize. So for example, in six dimensional space, we can take dot products like this one. These are vectors with six entries. Okay, but the way it works is you just multiply entry wise and add them up just like in two and three dimensions. All right, so three times zero is zero. Minus two times one is minus two. Zero times three is zero. Four times minus two is minus eight. 1 times minus 7 is minus 7, and 2 times 3 is plus 6. And then you just add all those guys up. Minus 2, minus 8 is, okay, now I'm at minus 10, then minus 7 more, now I'm at minus 17, plus 6 all together. I mean, you go through the calculation, you get minus 11 as your answer. Okay, so hopefully there's nothing too surprising about how the formula for computing dot products works out. All right, so great, we know how to compute them now. Now, I said a couple lectures ago that whenever we introduce a new operation in this course, we're gonna prove a theorem that provides us with some of the nice properties that that operation has, okay? So here is that theorem for the dot product. This is the theorem that tells us what nice properties the dot product has, okay? So the first property is something similar to what we've seen before with vector addition. It says it doesn't matter what order you do the dot product in, okay? So if you've got two vectors, V and W, if you do V dot W, you get the same thing as if you do W dot V, okay? You can swap them doesn't change anything. And again, we call this commutativity just like we did with vector addition, right? Commutativity for vector addition meant that V plus W was always the same as W plus V. Same thing for dot product, okay? We also have an, uh, a property that's analogous to distributivity, okay? Remember, distributivity for scalar multiplication and vector addition said that if you do a scalar times a sum, you can sort of bring that scalar onto the two vectors individually. Okay, and something similar happens with the dot product. We can sort of think of the dot product like multiplication in a sense, and it distributes over addition in the same way that multiplication does. If you do v dot w plus z, so v dot a sum, well, you can just do v dot each vector in that sum individually and then add up afterwards. Okay, so it's sort of a way of swapping the order, right? Like on the left here, we, do, we have to do the addition first and then the dot product. Whereas over here on the right, you do two dot products first and then the addition, okay? So you're swapping the order of operations. That's distributivity, okay? And then property C here says that it plays well with scalar multiplication, okay? It doesn't matter if you multiply one of the vectors in the dot product by a scalar or you compute the dot product first and then multiply that result by a scalar. You get the same thing either way.
Okay. And again, we're not going to prove all three properties in this theorem. The proofs of all three of them are very similar to each other. So I'm just going to prove property A here to give you a taste of how it works. Okay, and just like with our theorem from last week, the way the proof is going to work is you just write down the definition of the thing and use the corresponding properties of real numbers, okay? Because we're already comfortable with real numbers, we can leech off of them. All right, so let's prove property A here. Okay, so what we're going to do first, just give names to the entries in the vectors, okay? In the usual way, so V is V1 up to Vn and W is W1 up to Wn because we're going to be working with those entries. So we want to be able to call them something. All right, now starting off, I want to show that the dot product over here equals the dot product over here. So we use the definition of the dot product. Dot product was it equal? Well, it equals this junk over here. It equals V1 times W1 plus V2 times W2, all the way up to Vn plus w Vn times Wn. Okay, and now our goal is to swap around the Vs and W, right? Because our goal is to get this dot product equaling the dot product of W with V. So we look at each of the terms in this sum and we notice that, hey, V1 times W1 that's the same thing as w1 times v1, right? We can swap the order of multiplication in each of these terms because, well, it's just a real number times a real number. And with real number multiplication, order doesn't matter. In other words, real number multiplication is commutative. Okay, so we can swap all of those v's with w's. And then when we add them up, we get exactly the dot product of w with v this time. Okay, so it's just like our proof that vector addition was commutative. We just break things down into entries of the vectors and use the corresponding property from real numbers that we already know about to prove the corresponding property of vectors that we want to show is true. Okay, and that's all that there is to, to it in the proof. We're done at this point. We've swapped the order of each of these terms, and this just by definition is the dot product of w with v, so we just trace the equalities through and these things are equal to each other. Okay, and the other two properties of that theorem can be proved in a very similar way. All right, so again, sort of the point of this theorem is to convince ourselves that we can simplify certain expressions in ways that we're used to and, and in ways that we would expect we'd be able to simplify those expressions. So for example, if we're given this dot product here, if we're asked to, if we're asked to compute one half of this dot product, well, now we sort of know how to compute that. First off, we know that that expression is not actually ambiguous because that expression could mean a couple different things. It could mean one half times this vector dotted with this vector. Or it could mean one half of this dot product, right? There are different ways that you can sort of group the order of operations here. And that previous theorem says it doesn't matter. In particular, part C of that theorem told us that it doesn't matter if you do the scalar times the vector and then dot or if you dot and then multiply by the scalar, you get the same thing either way. So for example, we could compute this as one half of the dot product. And the dot product is minus one times six gives me minus six. And then minus three times minus four gives me 12. And then two times two gives me four. You add those up, you're gonna get 10, and then you multiply by half to get five. Okay, so that's one valid way to go through the computation. You dot and then multiply by the scalar. But the theorem says that another way you could go through that computation is you could do one half times one of these vectors and then do the dot product. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna compute it differently. I'm gonna do one half times this vector on the right and then do the dot product. And when I do that, okay, first vector didn't change. Second vector now is just three minus two, one. And when I do that dot product, I get minus three plus six plus two, and you add that up and you get five. And of course, it's the same answer. The theorem told me that it, it's gonna be the same answer, okay? If I wanted to, I could also instead do this a third way. I could do one half times the first vector and then do the dot product. And again, I'll get five that way as well. Any of these are valid ways to do that computation. All right, as another example of the type of thing that we can do with this theorem is we can sort of use the theorem to prove other theorems. Okay, so for example, we're gonna show now that if you ever have a sum dotted with a, that same sum, then you can sort of split that apart in a way that's analogous to how you square out brackets of real numbers, right? Like if you have X plus Y all squared and X and Y are real numbers, then probably what you do is you say, oh, well that equals X squared plus two XY plus Y squared, right? You get double the cross term and squares of the individual terms. Well, something similar happens with the dot product. Like this is sort of analogous to squaring of vectors. And what you get is you get V dot V, okay, that's kind of analogous to V squared, and W dot W, that's kind of analogous to W squared, and then you get double a cross term in the middle as well. Okay, so how do we prove this? How do we show that this happens? 
Well, I'm just going to leech off of that previous theorem that we proved, okay? So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to remember that, hey, that theorem told me that if I have something dotted with a sum, then I can split up that sum that's on the right there, okay? So this is distributivity. This is part B of that theorem. I'm going to, I'm going to scroll back really quickly to the theorem to remind you of this, okay? So the theorem said if I have any vector dotted with a sum, then I can split up that sum that's on the right. Okay, so that's what I just did here. I didn't split up the sum on the left. I'm thinking of that as my first fixed vector. I'm splitting up the sum on the right. Okay, and then property A of that theorem says that, okay, if you've got dot product between two vectors, you can swap the order. So I'm going to do that with both of these terms here. I swap the first one, so now it's V dotted with the sum instead of the sum dotted with V. And the second term is similarly now W dotted with the sum instead of the sum dotted with W. Okay, so that's part A of the theorem. Next up, now that I've got the sum on the right, I'm going to use property B of that theorem again, okay? Because here it's something dotted with a sum and something dotted with a sum. And in both of those cases, because I'm dotting with a sum, I can use distributivity to break that up. So this first term here becomes these two terms here. And this W dotted with a sum becomes W dotted with V plus W dotted with W. Okay, so that's property B again. Okay, and finally, the last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna use property A again to simplify these two cross terms here, V dot W plus W dot V. But property A tells us that those are the same, right? If you swap the W dot V, it becomes a V dot W, which is just another V dot W. So property A tells us that these cross terms are the same, so there's two of them, there's double the cross term. Okay, so what we just proved is that something very analogous to FOIL, if you've ever heard that acronym, something very analogous to FOIL happens for vectors, okay? FOIL said if you've got like x plus y squared, then, you know, it's like first times outer, or for, like first times first, and then, you know, multiply the outers and multiply the inners and multiply the lasts. Well, you can do something similar with dot products as well, as long as, you know, multiplication is the dot product. All right, so that'll do it for today's lecture. Now that we've seen the basics of the dot product, what we're going to do in the next class is we're going to see that we can use the dot product to define the length of a vector. And then from there, we're going to start talking about things like the angle between vectors as well. Okay, so I will see you soon for that.